Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of the Daily Great Refuel, where we cap the latest news in the Ethereum ecosystem. I'm your host, Ian, this is Sano, and today's the 11th of March, 2024. All right, everyone, let's get into it. So before we jump into the news over the last few days, just wanted to shout out here that Adriano, who runs the Ethereum Art Daily Initiative here, is featuring one of my AI-generated pieces as part of his uh, kind of uh, collection here. So this is the one that, that I've titled The Blobs Are Coming. It's got an ETH logo in the middle with a bunch of blob-like monsters surrounding it, obviously because Den Kuhn is going live very soon, uh, you know, less than three days now, less than two or around two days, I think, from from time of recording here. So very, very close to Denkun now. Now this is up for auction. So I'll link this in the YouTube description below for you to go check out. Uh, and all proceeds, uh, once this does get, uh, I guess like bought out or once this does, once the um, the auction ends here, all the proceeds go to the Protocol Guild. So I'm not making any money from this or anything like that. Uh, all the proceeds will go to the Protocol Guild. So if you wanna own this piece, you can. It's being auctioned off on foundation.app. The reserve is 0.05 ETH. You can place your bid on here. Uh, if you want, I'll, as I said, I'll link this in the YouTube description below, but I just wanted to give a shout out there and thanks to Adriano for putting this there. I think it's one of the better AI pieces I've generated around Ethereum. It came out really, really well. So yeah, I'm glad to see that it's featured uh, like this. All right, so I know I've talked a lot about the ETH ETFs lately, but we need to talk about it again. And I think I'm gonna spend a little while on this. So if you want to skip ahead and you're sick of me talking about the ETF stuff, you can, there's timestamps, please skip ahead. Uh, but just fair warning, there's gonna be a bit of talk here because uh, there was some interesting news over the last couple of days. So the first bit of news is from Eleanor Tourette here who works at Fox Business. You'll probably remember her from when she was tweeting about the BTC ETFs. Well, today she tweeted out that she had a scoop uh, saying optimism about the SEC approving the ETH spot ETFs by May 23rd is waning. Now, she's basing this on things that she's heard from various sources. Obviously, she doesn't give away who her sources are, but essentially it boils down to that the SEC staff has been uh, very hard to engage with uh, for the issuers or for the potential issuers of the ETH ETFs, such as BlackRock, VanEck, ARK, and you know, Grayscale, their, their conversion, and so on and so forth. Honestly, after reading this tweet, I didn't really think much of it. I read it, and I'm like, okay, well, you know, you're saying sources say this, and the SEC staff playing hard to get, so to speak, is not really something that surprises me, to be honest. And as I mentioned to you guys before, uh, essentially the ETH ETFs are just a copy paste of the BTC ones. They're not staked ETFs; they're just normal spot ETFs. So they're really a copy paste of the ETH ones, which means there doesn't need to be that much engagement between the SEC and the issuers over this, like there was for BTC. And we're still, you know, two and a half half months almost out from May 23rd. So there's still time here. But what I wanted to talk about was a tweet that I put out where I said, uh, I, I quote tweeted what Eleanor said here. And I said, I'm no expert on the inner workings of the SEC and US politics, but the way I see it is this. The SEC is in checkmate when it comes to the ETH ETFs. If they don't approve them, they know that they will get sued into oblivion and be forced to approve them anyway. And I don't think Gary wants yet another high profile loss against his name. So I think their reluctance comes from knowing that they are in checkmate, but they are trying de desperately to find some way to deny the ETH ETFs without also hurting themselves. Spoiler alert, they won't find a way. So they are literally in checkmate. Uh, maybe not literally because they're not playing a game of chess, but they are, in my opinion, in checkmate here. They are stuck and they're stuck for a few different reasons. But the main reason is because of the fact that the they approved the ETH futures ETFs back in October. Then Grayscale won their court case against the SEC about the SEC denying spot BTC ETFs when they approved the futures BTC ETFs. And that forced the SEC to approve Grayscale's, uh, sorry, to approve all of the BTC ETFs on Jan 10th. It's the exact same playbook happening here right now guys so that's why that's the main reason why the SEC is in checkmate here now there are three things that the SEC can do here none of them are good for the SEC in my opinion none of them are positive at all and none of them involve SEC getting out of checkmate what I like to say is that the SEC can do these three things but each of these things is flipping the table you know flipping the table flipping the board and just basically uh you knowing you're in checkmate but like being a sore loser so to speak so the three things that they can do First, they can obviously deny the ETFs, right? As I've said before, that makes absolutely no sense for them to do that. There's no positives for them to do that, but they can do that. It's up to them. They have no one stopping them from doing that. They can deny them. But what do you think happens when they deny them? I mean, for everyone who's been listening to me for quite a while, you know exactly what happens. They're going to get sued immediately. I would actually say that the same day that they deny the ETFs will be the day that Grayscale sues them, at least Grayscale. The other ones might sue as well, but at least Grayscale will sue them uh, for the same, you know, using the same uh, lawsuit they used against 
system for the BTC ETFs. Uh, and then they'll win in court. It will be a very quick court case, in my opinion, because they have the precedent to lean on, they being the judges or whoever, whichever judge is assigned to this. Um, so yeah, they're going to get sued straight away. Uh, and it's not going to and it's just going to basically what it's going to do is going to delay it. It's not going to stop it from happening. It's just going to delay it. It's going to punt it down maybe a few months and then it'll it'll get approved. So I, I don't really see what the point of doing that is. Like it doesn't actually end well for the SEC at all. Uh, and even politically, I don't really think it flies well either. Okay, that's the first thing. The second thing is that they can ask the issuers to withdraw their applications, uh, which would technically not be a denial. If the issuers say, okay, well, well, we'll withdraw the applications and we'll come back next time. That is technically not a denial of the ETFs, but obviously it means the ETFs aren't going live. Now, again, this is uh, pro this is probably like the, the, um, the thing that is, I guess, like least bad out of the three things that I'm going to mention for the SEC here, but it's still not great because, okay, what happens? The issuers withdraw the, e the ETF applications, okay, when do they refile? They're not going to want to wait to refile. They're probably going to refile quite quickly. Um, and at the same time, all it takes is one of them to say no. Like it's it's kind of a game of, uh, I guess, like a prisoner's dilemma, right? Where it's like, okay, well, it, we all got to say no together. But if one defects, well, then that one gets to uh, basically, you know, if, if the ETFs get approved, then they're the only one that gets approved, right? And the other ones have withdrawn. So it doesn't really actually make sense when you once you play out the game theory. So I don't think they're going to withdraw. And I definitely don't think Grayscale would withdraw if asked to, right? Um, and then from there, if they all refuse to withdraw and the SEC denies, we fall back to the first point I made about how denying it is just dumb, right? Now, the third thing is probably even dumber than denying the ETFs, uh, the spot ETFs, and that would be delisting the ETH futures ETFs, or I guess like uh, uh, canceling the, I don't know what the, the correct word is here. But I think delisting might be the correct word here. Basically, they approved them in October. And if they basically say, okay, well, we don't want them anymore. We're delisting them. Okay, well, first they have to give a reason for doing that. And whatever reasoning they give is going to be completely flawed and not based on reality. The CFTC is going to be extremely upset with them, right? So not, not only will there be an interagency, interregulatory agency war in, in you know between the SEC and the CFTC over this, the SEC is, is likely to get sued for, for this as well. So out of these three things that they could do, which as I said, is called flipping the table here. This is not anywhere. They're in checkmate. There's nothing they can do at this point. They see the board. They know where all the pieces are. They know where they are right now. They know that it's either approve or flip the table by doing these three things, right? And I think that each of these three things is not positive for the SEC in any way whatsoever. It's not positive politically at all, and it just ends in ruin for them every single time. So then, okay, what is the path of least resistance? It's to be a, I guess, like, a humble, uh, I guess like a humble player in the game and to basically concede defeat and to accept that you're in checkmate, you lost, you played yourself because the SEC actually approved the ETH Futures ETFs in October. It wasn't that long ago. So they really shot themselves in the foot by doing that because if it wasn't for that, the arguments that they would approve the ETH ETFs would, would not really hold much water. And I would actually be one of the people saying that I don't think the chances are that high if it wasn't for that. But because they've done that and because Grayscale won their case based on that, that is really what most of it rests upon. Um, and I think that there is a consensus right now among, I guess, the people who are taking a more, uh, I guess, like neutral stance on this, that if the SEC was to deny, the reason that they would use was that the correlation between the futures uh, 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 spot ETH trading and futures ETH trading um, is is subject to manipulation, is subject to be to fraud and, and things like that. Now, we I saw, I mentioned the other day that Coinbase and Grayscale met with the SEC and basically did their own analysis and explained to them that the correlations are basically one-to-one. -one. I mean, not that close, but basically one-to-one, -one, which means that if they are implying that fraud is happening, they would be saying that the fraud was happening on the uh, the CME futures market, the Chicago Mercantile uh, Exchange futures market in the US, which is a very heav heavily regulated market. So that would be an own goal. They'd be shooting themselves in the foot over that. So given all of that, as I said, path of least resistance is for the SEC to approve the ETFs. That's why I'm so confident in them being approved because I do think that, uh, you know, as much as Gary hates crypto, as much as Elizabeth Warren hates crypto, as much as they've been hostile towards crypto, there is just no way for them to deny it cleanly, deny the ETFs cleanly. And if they want to go to court again, if they want to lose in court again, you know, if they want to uh, spend all that time and effort if they want to uh, reduce the SEC's credibility even further and set even more bad precedent for the SEC in courts, be my guest, you know, be our guest here. But 
the better path is just to approve these things. And then they don't have to worry about anything after that. There is no more ETFs going to come after that for a very long time. It's going to be many years. As I've explained before, the um, the issuers won't even bother to apply for an, e ET uh, sorry, an ETF for other assets because those other assets don't even have a CME futures market, which is a requirement before you can get a spot ETF approved. So this is, a, this is off their table for, for a long time. They approve them, okay, whatever, it's off their table. I don't have to deal with that anymore. And they could potentially even just go back to being shitty towards crypto by bringing frivolous lawsuits against crypto companies. Yeah, okay, that's really shitty. But hey, like focus on, you know, then now they get to focus on that instead of the, the ETF stuff. So that's where my confidence comes from, guys. And as I've said before, I could be wrong on this, as, as in like wrong on them getting approved. I do think with 100% certainty that they're going to get approved at some point. I do think they're going to get approved by May 23rd, but like my, my prediction isn't 100%. It's like 99%. And that 1% is basically the SEC flipping the table and saying, well, no, fuck you guys. We're going to, you know, deny or de delist or request withdrawal of these things for such and such reason. But as I just explained, that would not be good for the SEC. Anyway, moving on from US centric ETFs, there are two other announcements that are more positive, and that's around the London Stock Exchange uh, basically has say, said that they're going to accept applications for Bitcoin and Ethereum ETNs in Q2 of this year. Q2 is next month, April, May, June. Now, an ETN is uh, basically the equivalent product to an ETF. It stands for exchange, exchange Traded Note instead of Exchange Traded Fund. I think there are some nuances and intricacies between the two, but it's essentially an equivalent product. So they announced that just today and I think that the market has reacted positively to that because BTC is at all-time highs, ETH is over 4k right now at time of recording, obviously positive news here. And then another bit of positive news was that Hong Kong reported that 10 financial institutions have planned to apply to launch Bitcoin uh, spot ETFs in Hong Kong and Ethereum spot ETFs are under discussion. So now you have two other huge financial hubs, Hong Kong and London, saying that they're going to list not only BTC ETFs, but also ETH ETFs or ETNs or are the equivalent products here. And then you have the SEC, you know, still potentially dragging their feet here. So is the SEC going to deny the ETH ETFs and cost the US, uh, I guess, like um, economic activity? You know, I mean, maybe they don't think about that, but that's like another consequence of them denying these things. So yeah, there's positive news out of both London and Hong Kong here. Hopefully the US gets this right. I really think that, uh, you know, I, I don't think that, uh, that Gary is going to be happy about approving these things if he does approve them, these things being the ETH ETFs. But I do think that the path of them approving them is very clear. And I think that the path of them denying them while also clear is just full of shit. Like it doesn't make any sense. Like uh, approving them, what do you think happens when they, uh, like, like do the calculus here. If they approve the ETH ETFs, no lawsuits. No one's angry at them. No bad politics, no ba bad publicity, no bad headlines, none of that. If they approve the ETH ETFs, good headlines, right? But, uh, the price will probably go up, so more good headlines. They they make all of those um, financial institutions happy as well. So maybe more donations to the Democrat party, right? Like you got to look at the layers to this year and what a denial versus an approval means. And it, it, in my eyes, like a, a denial is literally just blowing yourself up. It literally is just like setting yourself on fire. There is no point to it. It would be a... Uh, and a total self-own would make zero sense. Um, but yeah, anyway, before I keep ranting about that, I'm going to end that one. Uh, that one there for today because there's a bunch of other stuff to get through but let me know if you agree or disagree with my analysis there as you can tell like I've done a lot of research into this I'm really passionate about this and I'm trying to not you know be too bullish about it but like I can't just I can't see the good path for the SEC to deny here I can't see a path where they deny and it ends well uh, for them on this. All right, so obviously the Denkun is going live this week. So I figured I'd give a little bit of a recap over two EIPs that obviously I'm super excited about with Denkun, um, just to refresh you. And a third one as well that may, you may not um, have heard about too much before. So obviously those two, uh, two EIPs are EIP 4844, Proto Dank Sharding. I've spoken about the Oblobs. I've spoken about this at length for years now. You guys don't need a refresher on this really, but I think what I wanted to say was that it's coming in Two days, guys, like just around two days from now. It is so close. Like it's, I get this feeling every time one of these upgrades comes. Like I was talking about the merge for so long, right? I was talking about EIP 1559 for so long. Now EIP 4844 I've been talking about for the same, like a long period of time as well. And now it's finally going live on the network and we finally get to see what the actual fees are going to be on the rollups that take advantage of EIP 4844 and how the network kind of, um, you know, evolves with it and, and how fast we increase the sizes of the blobs, right? Like how comfortable we are with increasing the, the, slice, uh, the sizes, what the load on the network's like, all that sort of stuff. We're going to learn a lot about this stuff and it's going to be super exciting. 
Second EIP is another one that I discussed with you guys a few weeks ago, EIP 4788, which basically creates an enshrined oracle that improves the communication between Ethereum's execution and consensus layers. I have a tweet here that describes what that is. I'll link it in the YouTube description below for you guys to check out. But essentially, it means that the execution layer can now access the consensus layer state regarding validator, um, the, the status of a validator. So for example, uh, if you want to know the status, uh, sorry, the balance of a validator, if you want to know yeah, the status of a validator, if it's like exiting or if it's in the withdrawal queue, so on and so forth, you no longer need a third party Oracle system to do that. Like Rocketpool has their ODAO system and other, other services have their own systems, but you no longer need to do that. So that is a huge unlock for Ethereum. And there's many use cases that are downstream of that. And the third EIP, which is 1153, is a very old EIP now, but it's finally being shipped in Denkun. And this mainly is good for developers and it allows uh, things like Unisop v4 to launch. So I think that's actually the biggest thing with this EIP. Yes, other developers are gonna take advantage of it, but obviously Unisop is the biggest app on Ethereum still. Uh, and it has been for a very long time. Everyone knows what it is, everyone uses it, whether you know it or not, you use it, you use the liquidity pools there. So this EIP going live allows Unisoft v4 to launch, which I believe their launch is slated for, I think Q3 or Q4 uh, this year sometime. Um, but yeah, Unisoft v4 is obviously a huge upgrade uh, of the Unisoft protocol, brings with it a lot of interesting features, but they, they haven't been able to launch because they are using some of the stuff that, or they're using what's 1153 enables, uh, but I'm not a developer, so I can't dive too deep into that there, but I know that developers are very excited about this. So great to see that finally go live. But you notice the number is very low, 1153, it means it's an old EIP. It's been in the works for a while, but it's finally make it in, making it into Denkun here. Um, and like last thing on Denkun is that uh, Trent Van Epps has been working on this delivery at dawn uh, animation or this one minute animation with the line studio and nouns uh, paid for it. So this film is going to be premiering uh, at um, 12 a.m. Uh, my time. So Australian Eastern Standard Time. Actually, I think this is going to be uh, today, I think. Uh, so yeah, I mean, uh, the Monday. Yeah, okay. So this is today. So I don't know what it's going to be in your local time zone. It's 1300 UTC uh, or 1 p.m. UTC, 9 a.m. Eastern time, uh, which is morning in, in the US there, but you can check this out. I'll link it in the YouTube description below. Uh, I got a sneak peek of this short. It's awesome, guys. There are so many Easter eggs for you guys to find. It's only a minute long, but it is the first time in Ethereum's history that we've had an animation made for an EIP. So it's just really great to see that. And I hope to see more of these made as time goes on. But yeah, I'll link that in the YouTube description below for you to check out. Now, before I finish up my talk uh, discussions about Denkun and everything. Uh, there is a live stream going to be happening. I believe it's tomorrow night, I think my time. Let me have a look here. No, it's it's in two days from now, but it's, it's midnight Thursday for me. So that means like Tuesday when, yeah, okay. So yeah, about two days and uh, yeah, from, from probably where, where, when you're watching this, there'll be a live stream uh, co-hosted by me, ETH Staker and ETH Cat Herders. We're gonna be watching Denkun go live on the network. I'm going to be answering all your questions as well on there. There's going to be a lot of great people on there. So I hope to see you guys there. You can find the link to it, I think, on ETH Staker's Twitter page, which uh, you can find if you just go on Twitter and obviously search for their page there. But yeah, guys, we are almost here. Almost, almost, almost here to Denkun. It is so close. Super excited about it. Uh, but yeah, we'll see. Uh, I'll do a recap on it once it goes live and we'll see what blobs are like and everything like that on the show in a few days from now. All right, Jason Chaskin here on Farcast. I put together a great thread uh, going over or breaking down something called execution tickets, which was originally presented by Justin Drake and formalized in a research post by Mike Nuder. Now, I remember I covered this I think I covered Mike Nuda's research post uh, maybe a couple of months ago or something like that around this, and you've probably already read this. But if you haven't read that post yet, then this thread from Jason is a really great read. It's only 15 casts long, and I'll link it in the YouTube description below. Uh, but it basically explains exactly what execution tickets are. So the high level is that it's uh, essentially shifts validators' roles and provides a lot of benefits to the, the protocol. So basically, it, it's kind of like this overall roadmap of shifting validators' roles from being block builders uh, to, to I guess, like, so, so, okay, right now today, a lot of validators aren't block builders because they're using MEV boost, but that comes with a bunch of issues uh, that, you know, MEV boost isn't enshrined in the protocol, it exists extra protocol, uh, and there are issues around censorship, uh, resistance, and the issues around kind of economic incentives, things like that, right? 
So execution tickets is one of these things that has been proposed as a way to essentially uh, uh, basically make it so that the validator is no longer proposing a part of the block that includes the list of transactions. So obviously that uh, kind of falls into what we're doing with uh, with um, uh, inclusion lists as well. Um, and as Jason explains here, now a slot or I guess like a slot... It, a slot is like 12 seconds in Ethereum, but we, some, we we mostly call them blocks, even though the block is part of the slot. But yeah, 12 seconds in Ethereum, but a slot would be split into two phases, a beacon round and an execution round. And as you can see here, this would work with inclusion lists in order to uh, improve Ethereum censorship resistant guarantees and take away a lot of the negative externalities from MEV boost and MEV generally. But I'm gonna butcher the explanation if I try to explain it. Jason does a much better job in his cast here or his cast thread. I'll link this in the YouTube description below uh, for you to check out there. But yeah, this is something to keep an eye on. It's not something that's probably going to go into the network anytime soon. Um, we'll have to see. I think inclusion lists will go live first in Petra or Pectra towards the end of the year. I'm probably ne actually Q1 next year. And maybe this goes in shortly after or happens shortly after. I'm not sure what the implementation is here. I don't know if it necessarily needs a hard fork or not. But yeah, it's still something that's in heavy research phase right now. I may not even make it into the protocol. We'll have to see. There are a bunch of things that are, you know, talking about a lot that don't make it into the protocol but yeah if you want to learn more about execution tickets go check out jason's uh, thread here i'll link it in the youtube description below for you to do so all right so there's been a lot of talk about l3s lately or layer 3s and i know that people have both bearish and bullish takes on these things i would say my general view is that i'm pretty neutral towards these things i don't think i'm bullish or bearish on them i see the use case but i also see the argument that they may not be necessary long term so maybe they are only necessary short to medium term and then long term they uh kind of fade away in in um you know in, in favor of better solutions so that's why i say i'm rather neutral on these things and I, I also hate the name because the name just opens us up to criticism and ridicule but whatever it's out there now but the reason i bring it up today is because jesse polak put together a nice little tweet here summarizing uh his kind of thinking around l3s and why he thinks that they're a net benefit so he says here the first point is that settlement costs for L3s will be 10 to 100 times cheaper. These costs are small, but for de developers, they are still meaningful. Uh, secondly, just in time bridging from L2 to L3 will be fast, cheaper, and significantly more capital efficient than going from L1 to L2 or L2 to L2. I mean, naturally, of course. Uh, and the pathway, uh, thirdly, the pathway for on ramps to L3s will be much more streamlined because you have L2 stakeholders who will work hard to make them seamless via routing through the L2. And then it continues. I think that on a long time period, some or all of these may be solved by proof aggregation but in the short to medium term horizon uh, i'm still working through how exactly that will shape up and then he continues with a bunch of other thoughts i'll link it in the youtube description for you to check out but he basically comes to the same conclusion i come to in that L3s may be necessary or maybe something people want to experiment with short, short to medium term. But if we get to a point where we can do cheap proof aggregation um, and do it seamlessly and have buy-in from like all the major L2s and they just start using it and it's just all seamless, then maybe a world of L3s doesn't make much sense. Maybe it, it is not something that is necessary uh, because really at the end of the day, you would only be doing it if it was necessary. You wouldn't be doing it for no reason. Um, so we're, we're going to have to see how that shakes out. But as I said, I'm rather neutral on this. I'm not bullish or bearish on them. I'm monitoring the space, seeing how they evolve. Honestly, I'm much more interested in the L2s, to be honest, like than the L3s, because the L3s build on top of the L2s. So really, I'm way more interested in the L2s themselves and how they're going to shape up because there's still so much work to do there uh, on the L2 and on the L1 as well. I mean, I talk about Ethereum L1 all the time, but the L2s, yeah, so much work left to do there, so much stuff left to do, so many upgrades left to come. I think that we're maybe putting the cart before the horse a little bit with the L3s, but I guess it's a permissionless ecosystem. People can work on whatever they want, but yeah, I'm neutral on them right now. Obviously very, very bullish on L1 and L2, like hyper bullish on both of them for completely different reasons, mind you, but very bullish on both of those things. Um, but layer three is definitely neutral right now. Maybe I become more bullish in the future. Maybe I become more bearish. I'll keep you guys updated on all of that. All right, last up here is just another thread from Nayrolf. So this thread goes over shared sequencing. Now, obviously shared sequences is a hot topic within the Ethereum ecosystem, and I have talked about it a lot on the refuel, but if you're still confused about what a shared sequencer is, how it works and everything in between, Nayrolf has a great tweet thread explaining all of this for you. So I just wanted to give a shout out to them. You can check out the tweet thread. I'll link it in the YouTube description below, but you can use this as a really nice springboard into learning more about, um, about shared sequences. It's not a very long thread at all, but it gives you that high level overview that you may may be missing and that, yeah, that you may want to uh, read about. So yeah, 
check that out. I'll link it in the YouTube description below. Now, I've got a few minutes left in today's episode. I wanted to leave a few minutes here because the market is heating up, guys. Like the market is really heating up now. We are entering, I would say, maybe halfway through the midpoint of the, the bull market. Uh, so I know it's weird to say that where I say like, we're, we're in the mid of the bull market, which means we're halfway through. But I'm also saying that we're halfway through the midpoint. And the reason I say this is because obviously BTC is at its all-time highs. It's, it's basically making new all-time highs every other day now. Uh, it seems to want, it, it seems to have broken through 70k. I mean, it's only been the last kind of, I guess, like day that it's not even day, like maybe eight hours that it's, that it's broken through 70k. It could come back down. Who knows, right? But we're in price discovery on BTC right now. ETH is not far behind, and then we have all this other stuff popping off. Like we're getting into the to, to, the, to the to the to the the craziness, guys. They're definitely getting into the craziness here. I mean, I know meme coins have been popping off and stuff, but I think the meme coin stuff is more the crypto natives trying to front run uh, retail investors coming back and buying meme coins. But I think that in a in in kind of a weird way, even though we're we're you know we're we're, we're definitely mid bull market or even you know even halfway through the mid bull market. I think in a weird way like there's not much noise, right? You probably haven't heard much on mainstream media. You probably haven't heard much from friends and family that aren't usually in crypto. Like the people that I've heard about crypto from that are friends and family are people that are already in crypto. Like my dad will talk to me about it and he, my dad follows my tweets and sometimes watches my videos as well. So of course he knows about it, right? He was talking to me about it when he was like a thousand dollars. So I don't count him. And then I have uh, some friends that have uh, been in crypto as, pretty much as long as I have, like my real life friends, not just not my my crypto friends, of course, my real life friends that are you know pre crypto, uh, talk to me about it. But I guess I'm talking about the people that just don't pay attention to crypto at all until things start getting hot again. I'm not seeing much of that personally. Obviously, it's anecdotal. Maybe you have a lot of that in your life right now. But it does seem like we're we're still relatively kind of quiet on that front. But those people usually come in towards the end of the midpoint into the late cycle. And that's why we see such violence kind of going up from there, right? Such violent price movements up. And that's why we see a lot of indiscriminate pumping across all of this stuff that shouldn't really be worth anything, right? <laughs> I know when you see everything just going up ridiculously, I'm not talking about meme coins. I'm talking about like just everything. Like meme coins, you can point to very specific reasons why those things are going up, right? But but I'm talking about like everything else that just ha has no reason to be worth anything just going absolutely haywire. And it's because it's just a flood of new money that comes in it's just all this, you can think of it like uh, literally like water, like liquidity, right? You can think of it like a water come flooding in and just like rising all the boats. That's ex that's essentially what happens, right? Uh, and that happens in the later stages of, of a bull market there. Uh, but the reason why, I mean, the main reason I'm mentioning this again is because, again, I'm going to do this quite regularly going forward. Just want to remind you guys, keep your heads on. I know it's exciting. I know it's very, very exciting that the bull market is getting more and more heated by the day. I know it's exciting that BTC is at all-time highs and ETH isn't far behind. I mean, ETH at 4, 000, over 4000 dollars today is at its highest price since December 2021. And back then, that was when it was on the way down, obviously. But that is a long time ago now. So it obviously feels really cool to see this happening here. But don't lose your heads, guys. That's my always going to be my advice. Just make sure you're still risk managing. Make sure you're sticking to your plan. Make sure you know you know whereabouts you, you, you plan to take profits because at the end of the day, you, it's all unrealized until you actually realize it into something else that you want. I mean, I, I've talked about this at length with Eric and on the refill, so I'm not going to rehash my points here, but I just want to remind you guys about that because I know how easy it is to get what I like to call bull market brain or kind of like the bull market virus. Very easy to fall into it. Very easy to lose sight of things. Um, you know, I've done that personally a lot of times as well. Uh, but this cycle, I feel a lot more muted, and I think it's just because it's the stage of where I'm at with kind of my uh, my crypto journey. This will be my fourth cycle in crypto technically. So yeah, I mean, I at, at this point in time, I like. I, can't, I don't really get that excited about it anymore, which is a good thing because it means that I can be more objective about it and be more level-headed headed about it uh, and make sh and I'm, I'm not suffering from the same emotions that other people are kind of suffering from when it comes to the markets. So that's why I'm trying to impart this kind of, I guess, wisdom onto all of you. And you can listen to me or not. I'm not saying you have to listen to me. I'm not saying that I'm right. I'm just trying to you know impart kind of objective wisdom because yeah, I, I really, even at ETH above 4K, I saw it and I'm like, okay, like I'm happy, but I'm not like euphoric and ecstatic. And I'm not like being like, oh my God, awesome, up only super cycle. Like I'm not like that at all. The I, I was probably last cycle a lot like that. But these days I'm very, very different here. So that's why I think I can look at things a bit differently and, and pass that on to you guys there. But I think on that note, that's going to be it for today. So thank you everyone for listening and watching. Be sure to subscribe to the channel if you haven't yet. Give it a thumbs up, subscribe to the newsletter, join the Discord channel, and I'll catch you all tomorrow. Thanks everyone.